Good evening, welcome to Von Marx Presents Marx Ado About Nothing. Marx Ado About Nothing. Marx Ado About Nothing. Where we apply the revolutionary Marx scale to classic and contemporary literature. Marx Ado About Nothing. Marx Ado About Nothing. This podcast contains mature content, spoilers, language, you have been warned. Hello and welcome back to Monster Do About Nothing. I am your host for this episode, Steve O, joined today by Jonathan Ian Manzer. Hello. And Scott Thurlow. Arigato. And today we are going to be doing the short story, uh, Mono no Aware by Ken Liu. Uh, this was a Hugo winner for a short story in 2013, and it's basically the story of a ship that is sent out across the galaxy to try and find a new home for humanity after the world has been destroyed and they run into a problem and they need to fix it somehow. So I'm going to let Scott give a short little synopsis or a short little uh, well, log line for my us. My log line I came up with a uh, supuko in space. <laughs> sort of, it's sort of that. <laughs> and, and we're going to go over to Ian to uh, talk about the intro body and conclusion. Give us a little more of a synopsis. I'm going to give a, very straight, linear relating of the story, but this work is divided quite a bit in timeline. It, well, it, it follows back and forth. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it follows the life of a young, uh, well, what starts off as a young boy named Hiroto who go, who is put upon this spaceship and it kind of cuts between prior to the asteroid that hit Earth and like wiped it out. And his um, adventures on this spaceship and growing up in this world. Mm-hmm. So you you really don't like you're you're seeing kind of moments of his life and the whole and the whole story of his parents and like how he ended up on here isn't very fleshed out at first. But as it uh, cuts back in time, more and more starts to be revealed, and mm-hmm. like you get start piecing together the entire storyline. Yeah. What happens is the world is. Uh, uh, back on Earth, people are aware that an asteroid is about to hit. So everyone is attempting to develop ways to like, basically evacuate Earth. Mm-hmm. And only America is successful in coming up with <laughs> Obviously, a... Obviously, uh, America saves a day. Uh, it's funny. is uh, Japan invested a lot of money and only to come out the very end saying, we have nothing. <laughs> uh, yeah. But and like there's rioting and looting and war going on on earth as everyone is it devolves into chaos but except in Japan yeah so where say. they uh kind of solemnly uh take in their fate but Hiroda's parents were familiar with this man named Dr Hamilton who has a extra spot on the American spacecraft and he was in love like back in college with Hiroda's mother hmm. but the mother convinces him to take uh, her son along. Uh, and then he, you see him uh, kind of uh, grow up in a spacecraft to get, uh, like, I think he gets only six years old. Eight, uh, I think. Or eight, something, something like, like that. that yeah. Very eight. Young. And you see him develop and he eventually gets a job basically keeping an eye on the solar sail that is, um, that's propelling them through, uh, the galaxy. And there's a tear and he, uh, he falls in love with this, um, I mean, Who's also a like this is a mostly American, and she's of uh, Hispanic uh, descent. He's of Japanese descent. They're kind of like the only. Uh, it, it, it's implied that it's heavily American, yeah. if not heavily kind of uh, the traditional white kind right. of American mm-hmm. thing. So they they get uh, they have the attraction because they're both outsiders in uh, that world. And then the sail gets damaged, and he sacrifices his life to fix the sail to. Obsessively save, uh, even though there's 300 years left, the human uh, race <laughs> through, uh, until they get to the next uh, location. Yeah, yeah, that's pretty much what happens. And yeah, you're like, so, so you went through it linearly, but I, I always sort of am a sucker or when done well, like flashback, like present time and then leading up to it. I think it can be effective. And I think it was in this one. I enjoyed it. It's kind of the story for me. I, it's, of course, got a little bit of a sci fi bent, but sort of hard ish sci fi, mm-hmm. you know. It's not, it's not a setup you haven't seen before, but I think it was utilized uh, quite well. It does a good job building tension for what 
for the past, like, you know, the flashback story, what happened on Earth, because it starts mm. out, like, yep. you know what's, you know what's going to happen at the, from the very beginning, but you don't know exactly how he gets onto the ship and everything that happened with his parents, so you get right. a much more intricate fam- family story from him as this, as it goes on, and that ties in a lot. I, I think that's going to tie in a lot to themes, but I thought that was very well done. And you know, in general, I thought I thought this was just a well written, well constructed story. Yep. But I particularly, like, it's not just arbitrary jumps in time. Right. It's in a sense you're seeing his memories of the past as they go along, mm. and like he'll be reminded of something, and then you'll see a scene of his uh, uh, the event that's triggered like triggered yeah, this memory, significant so, moments yeah. that uh, he's flashing back to essentially. Yep. And I agree uh, with both you guys. It was all damn well done. I thought uh, well paced out and. For the length of stories, probably like 16, 18 pages, something like that. And I was uh, very enthralled. If not enthralled, but I wanted to keep reading. And it was, like I said, parceled out quite nicely. And yeah. I enjoyed all of it. Yeah. And this is a short story. I mean, it's a pretty short story. I can see why it's, it won the Hugo. It's probably like, what, well. 15 pages yeah. or something? Yeah. So uh, there's not too much more to say about this. I think we're going to go more in depth in themes and stuff. I have one kind of caveat to this. Because I didn't – I'm not like the biggest sci-fi fan. Mm-hmm. Uh, and yes, it's hard sci-fi. But I don't think that was necessarily the intent of the narrative. No, I mean, I'm sure. It yeah, was, I agree with you. It was I mean. a framework for a character story, especially right. about like a Japanese individual, sure, ice like in a foreign environment. Yeah. Whether it have been at America and no apocalypse happening, or if you have just this happened to be in space, but it was a very good kind of. Cultural isolation mm, story. Yeah. Yes, yeah. I, I, so. I like that. That's well put. And uh, I liked all of it. I'll probably give it a three total, one to everything. Yeah, I'm going to definitely give it a three for this. It, you had asked those questions uh, about would I give it a 10 uh, just by a, a rating? Like, off. Mm-hmm. I, I want to I give this a two, but I have no reason to. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And I, I almost said the about, same thing myself. Yeah. And so I have to give it a three because there's, like, narratively, it's – not necessarily flawless, but approaching that at least. Mm. Like I think it's well constructed. Mm. It's story. well structured. Yeah, exactly. So I'm gonna definitely give it a three. All right, precisely. All right, so that's threes all around on that. Uh, so we're gonna move to themes with Scott Thurlow. All right. So Ian just sort of touched on one. Um, maybe both briefly did, but yeah. So the title of the story. Um, let's just sort of t- mention this here. Is that it's sort of a a Japanese sort of way of thinking, a, a mode of thought, a Zen like um state right. where you become. You are at peace with or aware and or at ease with the passing, the inevitable passing of all mm-hmm. things, of life and of everything else, of stars even, whatever it may be. So that's sort of something that um, the character, uh, Hiroto, uh, his father teaches him early on and it's sort of ingrained, sort of like comes back to the forefront in the situation he finds himself in at the ship. So I think that's kind of a major one, like sort of y- your relationships are bigger than yourself, you know community and family and you know and of course he makes the heroic sacrifice at the end in order to save the rest of the ship he knows he's not going to make it or has to use his uh resources that ostensibly were going to get him back to the ship but something else goes wrong he has to use those sacrifices himself sort of sees a sort of sees himself imagined himself talking to his father and his father basically you know tells him this is the right thing to do you should do it so it's all that and sort of also like not offhandedly but beneath that is i had a couple lines picked out maybe i'll go back to it in dialogue but it's like the America is saves the day again, but kind of, but not really. <laughs> Good. I think I have another one, but I think well, I want to speak about, about that yeah. because there's a great use of identity, mm. uh, cultural identity in this yes. work, and it starts off with uh, him writing, uh, discussing Japanese characters, and he actually br- he brings up uh, uh, maybe twice throughout the entire work. Yeah, but it's also reference to like J- uh, Japanese philosophy and. Uh, like go and yes, uh, poetry, culture, and so forth. all these aspects to really, to really. I mean, you deal, you're dealing with the American, also like identity, and uh, everyone acts in this. And I don't mean this in a negative way, but like when they're talking about the reactions to different nations and how they take the end of the world, the Japanese are solemn about it. The Americans end up going to war with someone. <laughs> yeah, yeah. These kind of like, and the Americans you see upon the ship are not, like it's not stereotypes to just like dismissive stereotypes these are like how you would you would imagine a culture would mm, react to exactly, it exactly yeah and it's also like, dealing with the loss of that identity as well because he's mm-hmm. the Good only point. japanese person on the ship and he's like i'm starting it's like certain things are starting to fade and he's really holding dear to that cultural identity and now that he's dead that entire 
in theory, he's gone. yeah, sure. Yeah, I mean, that's, it's, that's it's, all a very good point, God, Steve. That's an interesting thing that I was thinking about. It was like, well, th- this whole short story is kind of about makes makes you know the Japanese culture look noble and like m- like more noble than the American culture, but it also makes a point of pointing out that the Americans got something done and the Japanese couldn't do that. And I wonder, I'm not, I'm not even sure if, if it's actually making a comment upon that thing on that, that aspect yeah. or not, or if that's like some, if that's subtext or not. But I just thought it was something interesting that I was thinking about as I was reading it. Too, I mean, that's kind of funny. I didn't actually think about it, but it's interesting that you raise it. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's basically everything we said. I don't think there's much more, but possibly I do like the identity thing as defined by yourself and the culture you grew up with and then faced with a, you know, a strange being an outsider mm-hmm. in any situation, especially sort of a sci-fi ish bent one. I thought it was quite well handled. And yeah, it was again uh, very nicely integrated into the whole plot. Assimilation is a one of the common themes you mm-hmm. get in mm-hmm. science fiction, but to see it. It's usually kind of an alien type aspect to it, sure, yeah, but this sure. is dealing with just it just so happens on a spaceship, yeah, um, where you are, you have a different culture than the predominant one, and no, in a sense, no one else to share it with, and how like that that aspect is very fascinating. That's why I said that this works as well as being a foreigner in a different land, hmm. and, or, as it does on a spaceship. I thought it was very well done. Yeah, and sort of like why also humorously said, um, Sapuku in space, you mentioned like the, the honor of the, of your yeah. Japanese culture, you know, and all that. So it's, it's all enfolded in there. And I thought, uh, again, like I said, very well done. Mm. I will give it a one. Yeah, I agree. I, I liked thinking about the themes of this as, uh, as we were going, as I was reading through it. All right. So that's going to move. As well. All right. Three ones. And it's going to move us on to antagonist with me. Asteroids. I, I yeah. I don't know. I guess, <laughs> I guess it's, it's tough because I think that this, whole short story is so laden with optimism in the face of awful, annihilation yeah like just <laughs> yeah. awful stuff yes basically death of coming at you from all angles but the uh hiroto has no he embodies this feeling of mono no aware where he's like you know or at least as it's written in here where he feels there's a certain beauty or a certain He's he's resigned, not even resigned, but you know he's accepting. He's, of it. He he accepts yeah. the fact that everything was going to end at some point. Stoic in the face of tragedy, basically. Yeah. So I like I, I don't know I I can't really name a good antagonist in this because I don't think that he allows anything to antagonize him, uh, and that's the entire point of this. Asteroids and mal- ship malfunctions, yeah. but I mean that's a vicious answer. But I mm, you're right. There's nothing like actively per se, but maybe we can sort of throw back to themes real quick where. He feels like he's losing his identity, at least a part of his identity. But that isn't really like he's not like struggling with it. Like right. you said, he he sort of embodies like is is trying to encapsulate the mono no aware feeling. Mm. Sorry, I mispronounced it, but good. Well, the thing is that it's a rejection of assimilation. Assimilation at the end when he goes out like he thinks his culture would, would want, want it mm. to, to yeah. and that's not like he doesn't know his culture aside from distant memories and impressions on it so he's in a sense the idealized version mm, of I like, that. Uh, he, like the japanese hero right. in here and I, I have nothing wrong with that and i'm probably gonna give him a very strong one as a protagonist but for antagonism i again I, even even they will all die in space <laughs> destruction it did not feel as pressing I, I i didn't necessarily buy the tension of the sale um, failing. I mean, maybe it wasn't sort of the point. Like again, we've, I don't think it was, but, like, we, we've sort of uh, ha- had this arise in a couple of other uh, Matsudus where it's not necessarily the fault of the story, but there just isn't. There either antagonist is lacking. You know, it's not about the antagonist mm-hmm. per se. So I may end up giving a soft zero because of that fact. I I'm, agree. I'm going to give it a zero for sure. It's all zeros, and that means Ian, you can talk about all that stuff that you just talked about <laughs> with the protagonist and more. Yeah. I, I basically just uh, because the. It's such a fascinating look at someone who is trying to hold on to a culture that they don't quite understand. Mm-hmm. And at points, like, he, he even addresses, I don't have a direct quote in front of me, but he goes, like, I don't have answers to questions people have about certain things. Yeah. Or, um, I think his lover, uh, dis- uh, asks him a question about the Japanese language. About manga and, and the language yeah, itself. And he's, yeah. And he doesn't really have like, – it doesn't work that way, but nor do, am I versed enough to 
uh, discuss that. And it's, right. th- there's, it's not like he's a passionless, like when I say he's a stoic kind of hero, he's not passionless. You definitely sure. do see that aspect of him. But that, that idea of him holding on to the past and trying desperately to while it's fading and li- literally <laughs> as they're yes. fading from the ruins <laughs> of earth, uh, like he's a, He's a tragic hero in certain respects, but he, yeah. who goes to sacrifice his life. And I'm going to cynically say, perhaps in vain, because they still have 300 years yeah, exactly. uh, ahead of them. But, I mean, like, but at this point in time, yeah, he, he's, he's a, per, he is a perfect personification of this ideal hero. And I think, but still with all like the flaws there. So mm-hmm. I'm going to definitely give it a very strong one. Yeah. I'll probably agree with most of that. I have much more to add, but yeah, I like the fact that. He knows that he knows some things about culture, about the culture that he's part of, but he's like, I know what I know, and that's what I can tell you. That's the best I remember and the best I can do, but it's, you know, it's not quite the same as what you think it is. Yeah. And I like his, I like the development that he has throughout the, I mean, you see him literally over the course of his entire life in this, in this story, and from being taken away from his parents, put on the ship, and then throughout the course of him being on the ship, learning how the sales, how the sale works and all that type of stuff is a really interesting development as he, as you're saying, Ian, like goes through trying to hold on to what made him Japanese and, and what made him, you know, and, and what he has left of his, of his parents and specifically his father, I think he talks about yes. mostly, but yeah, I, he's a really strong protagonist. I, I thought this was a, uh, yes. I thought he was probably one of the strongest parts of this story. I enjoyed his portrayal as well and I will give it a one. Yep, ones, 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 ones. All right. So that will move us on to supporting characters with Scott. So this one I was also debating. Maybe one of you gentlemen can convince me one way or another. I'm initially leaning towards a soft zero only because they're not like, you know what? Maybe not quite, but on the strength of perhaps his, uh, the memories of his father, mm-hmm. that might be the best one. And, you know, his parents too, but specifically his father. Yeah. Um, Dr. Hamilton was a sort of there. Uh, Mindy was like there as well, but like they, they don't really have like fleshed out arcs or anything. But again, not the point. It's, it's a short story. There's no need for that per se. But maybe like the depiction of the people back on Earth when it was falling apart. Right. So I mean, maybe I have to convince myself to give it a, a soft one instead. But uh, I mean, they, they were well enough. And like I said, certainly his father I think was the strongest and most important side character, at least, in, at least um, in his memories, and then in his own mind, like as he was sort of hallucinatory flashing back to what his father might say or think about it. I definitely agree with you on that. I think that perhaps the only other supporting character that was really important to this was just part of teaching the lesson was the kid Bobby, Mm. who was just an annoying little American kid, but (laughs) bratty American, but it was important. He he was important to the point that the author was trying to make um, during that section about go and chess and all that type of stuff. You can get rid of any supporting character in this work except for the father. Yeah. Without yeah, good point. him there, this story would, wouldn't would be anywhere wouldn't near be as strong as, yeah. strong as it is. Yeah, yeah. yeah, I agree with that. So on the strength of that, I think I'll probably, in our grand edition, he, his father is enough to deserve a one for supporting, and everyone else is sort of there and was fine. What I find interesting is even though he does reference other aspects of the Japanese culture – Really, it's the culture of the father. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you're right about uh, that. Uh, son is hanging on to. It's a subtle and well done yeah, point, though. Like, I, I actually, I, I like the father more than any other character in this story. Just be, uh, and actually, he had a lot of growth throughout yeah. this as well, for being kind of a stoic, uh, traditional like Japanese stereotype mm-hmm. to letting his son be taken away by an American because the American loved his wife Mm -hmm. and like just accepting that was a like phenomenal little uh, touch there. Yeah. So I'm going to give the father a very strong one. I will do the same. Yeah, I I agree. I think, yeah, I think I have to. I I liked his, the part that his mother played too. Well, yes, he was fine, but again, just not as strong or as important, I think, but there's nothing wrong with her depiction. Um, all right. So that's ones all around for that. And it's going to be, to me for dialogue and the dialogue you mentioned or we were talking about this outside and I think maybe I said or maybe somebody else said that it's very Japanese which it is uh, especially you know the the flashback scenes where he's speaking with his father yeah. there's 
a cadence that you get if you read, you know, if you read some of those Japanese short stories and stuff like that, that is, and, and, and novels and stuff that, that becomes very apparent. Uh, uh, yeah, obvious. Like, you, you know, it's, this seems Japanese to me, you know, like you can kind of pick it out. Which I I really liked about it. I don't know. Do we? Did you know those offhand? Is this a translation? Was it originally written in Japanese? I, I don't know if we know. I that. don't. I don't think it's a translation. I think this was written in, in okay. English. Uh, but I'm not 100 percent sure. But uh, the okay. I, I was curious about that, and I I think it, it doesn't is say- because it, there's certain aspects of this that wouldn't work. Like the idea of comparing the English phrases to the Japanese phrases. And like, right, well, that's I think what I was that asking. It, I think yeah. it was initially uh, English. I yeah, and and the the author is the author has written a bunch of, of stuff, but he lives in Boston, I think. Okay, or somewhere in Massachusetts. Yeah, near Boston. Okay. Just want to. And throw that uh, thing. but the other thing is, he does translations for a living, so mm. he'll he'll translate other stories or whatever. Mm. I was reading about him, so okay, Go he on. he kind of has that both of those languages down. Which is pretty apparent in this, you know, like you get the kind yes. of the feel of an American dialogue when he's talking to an American and you get definitely the Japanese feel when he's talking to his father, like early. Or the neighbors or whatever. Yeah, in the flashback. Yeah, exactly. So, I mean, that's that's all I'm really going to talk about with the dialogue. Well, I, I think I found the one you want because I picked this one out while I was reading it. Uh, it goes back to what you were saying. He's talking to Mindy about um, how Japanese language works and mm-hmm. like both written and spoken. And he says... His, my father used to say, there are a thousand ways of phrasing everything, each appropriate to an occasion. He taught me that our language is full of nuances and supple grace, each sentence a poem. The language folds in on itself, unspoken words as meaningful as spoken, context within context, layer upon layer, like the steel and samurai swords. <laughs> and like, that's really awesome. Yeah. Like, I quite like that. So, like, yeah, I mean, everything you just said and lines like that, I think it was quite strong. Yes, you can certainly sort of... uh it's noticeable that it's a Japanese-ish, like a like almost a Murakami story, mm. if you will. But yeah, I mean, I, I enjoyed it a lot. And usually I complain about dialogue <laughs> in such a story of this nature. Right. But it, I, I think it was strong in this one. Well done, at least. And I think that it, it not just served the narrative, but it served the themes quite mm-hmm. a bit. Yes, good point. So I, I'm going to think, I'm going to give it a one for it. Agreed on that. All right. One's all around on that one. And we're going to move on to style with Ian. So there is a slight hard sci-fi bent to this, but I feel that only used really as a framework. Mm-hmm. Mm, yeah. Where a majority of it, is, the style is dealing, as I brought up throughout this entire thing, and I'm gonna, uh, it's the idea of the Japanese identity. And it keeps bringing up like aspects of it, and it opens, like there are some huge drawings of uh, Japanese characters in which he is relating aspects of the hard sci-fi to like, this is a character in Japanese. This is what our ship looks like. Mm. And, but what I really was it that found interesting was the uh, Japanese poetry. And I'm going to give one, uh, okay. give one that I really enjoyed, which is nothing in the cry of cicadas suggests they are about to die. Mm-hmm. Uh, I forget the poet who actually did that, but it, I, I looked it up. It was a very it, this entire thing is like I I think they touched upon most of, or from what little I know about <laughs> Japanese culture, they hit upon a lot of aspects of it mm. and used it effectively and kind of mournfully at the same time, with also trying to get across stylistically, explain to an outsider. It's not everything you see on the surface. Here's what the actual intent of our stoicism is, what the intent of our, like, right. and, and I thought it was really well done. Yeah. No, I agree with all that. And, uh, yeah, I kind of, I, I sort of, again, am partial to when authors use like <clears throat> visual things. Like, so it starts off with like, our spaceship looks like this character for umbrella in, mm-hmm. in Japanese. And also definitely like the use of haikus throughout sort of as yeah. a, mo- a recurring motif. And I'll just read my, a dialogue and both dialogue and style. The one that I like was at the very end. <clears throat> at the very end, when uh, he sort of uh, realizes he's going to sacrifice himself, he hears his dad's voice uh, recite to him, "The stars shine and blink. We are all guests passing through. A smile and a name." And then he calls in, like, "Here's what I'm going to do. Yeah, it'll kill me." But then he leaves off at that. So yeah, it, it was as strong as uh, probably themes. And uh, like you said, he sort of in, uh, they service each other. Yeah, I, I mean, I love, that's, that was pretty much what I was going to say. I love the haikus around the poetry and the, just the, the feel of this whole thing didn't 
it wasn't it was sci-fi you got that you were on a ship for most of it and you got that there was an asteroid coming and about to slam into earth but it didn't you overuse that in any yes, way exactly it was more of a framework as i think one and of you mentioned yeah so. uh, would, yeah ian you, you mentioned that earlier and, and i completely agree with that uh, just using that as the framework for telling a more human story i guess mm. and i think it did a really good job of that uh, this is a completely off the topic uh mentioned here but i was a huge fan of japanese death poetry mm -hmm. uh for a while yes i remember I your like a collection of them <laughs> and if you if you enjoy this story Check out Japanese as well. It's, it's fascinating with like Zen Buddhists and Samurai yeah. and all that. So I just wanted to give that shout out. Right, fair yeah. enough. Yeah. I think we're all giving it a one though. All right. Yeah, it sounds like one's all around for this one, correct? Mm -hmm. Yep. All right. And that's going to bring us to the last question. Recommendation, Scotty. Yes, uh, read it. This is quite an excellent short story. A uh, good pick, Steve-O, and it was technically his pick. But this, again, I was sort of like, this is kind of the story for me. Like, it is, And it's a Hugo winner. Mm -hmm. So I have a number of collections of Hugo uh, back in the day myself. And yeah, it, I, I can see why it won. It was excellently done all around. And I, again, I'm partial to anything of this nature. But I think it was a very well-structured and well-integrated uh, one with the themes and so forth, as we spoke about, that were contained therein. Yeah, I'm not a huge, again, as I to reiterate, I'm not a huge sci-fi fan, and I was very impressed by this. I thought it handled the human elements incredibly well, and it was a very touching story, actually. Mm -hmm. So I, I would give it a strong recommendation, actually. So what am I, uh, one for five so far? <laughs> On uh, uh, recommending stories? You're coming <laughs> back, you're coming back. This is, uh, this, yeah, I, I mean, A, I, did recommend that we read this story. Yeah, although a good story, folks. Although I hadn't once. read it first, I will be. Yeah. I, I will uh, say that, but right. um, it seemed like it was going to be up my alley at least, mm. and, and uh, I'm glad that you guys liked it too. So I would say any anybody you can read it in 25 minutes or so, and it's a it's a really good story. So it's no it Harry out. Turtle Dove though. <laughs> it's no <laughs> nothing yeah, ever right. will be. <laughs> Thank God. When the um, earth blows up, we'll leave that story behind. So. This was pretty simple. We all basically, not basically, we all gave the exact same scores for the exact same reasons. Mm -hmm. And this one is going to, well, we all gave nines, and it's going to have an ag aggregate score of a nine as well. Indeed. Uh, I think that's uh, damn deserved. Yep. So, yeah. Anyway, we're going to close it out here. This has been Steve-O, your host, here joined by Jonathan Ian Manzer. I have to go build a solar cell. <laughs> and Scott Thurlow. I'm going to have to go fix that solar cell when it breaks. <laughs> Good night. Good night. Lots to do about nothing. Lots to do about nothing. Music by Chris Morgan. Editing and engineering by Stephen Ramos. Lots to do about nothing. This has been a Lawson's production. All rights reserved. <laughs>